Yeah. Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Build 68 till I die. Get I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph Children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Pastor. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. Drink responsibly tonight. I'll be drinking with you. Terrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Field of 68. After dark. We are live here on the Field of 68 After Dark. It's a brand new week in college basketball, and we're here to welcome you into that brand new week. My name is Greg Waddell. I got Matt McCall with me. I got Jarrell McNeil with me. We got a lot to get to tonight. As I speak, Kansas and Kansas State. Coming down to the wire, about four minutes left in that game. Kansas State with a slight lead at the moment. We will react live as soon as that game comes to its conclusion. We had some action in the ACC, although action might not be the best word to describe Miami's <laughs> offense tonight. We'll, uh, we'll get to that, gentlemen, in just a little bit. It's Monday, which means we have to do our Monday overreactions, which I know is Matt McCall's favorite subject on the show. McCall, by the way, is this a schedule loss for us? We got the back-to-back from, from Goodman and Doster back to back. after last night to tonight. Do we get to blame them if we're a little sluggish in the second half tonight? We'll be fine. We're back-to-back, baby. Back-to-back. 6 07 national championships, man. Uh, graduate assistant coach on the first one, ops guy on the second one. So we'll be fine. Let's go. Last team to do it. Come on, Greg. Me and you. Let's go. I like it. You're, you're right. You just talked me into it. You're right. I just had to get revved up. Uh, Jarrell, it's good to see you as always, my friend. Let's jump right into the action. I'll throw it to you first. Uh, Jarrell, you got a lot of buckets in your career. I know that. I was the first. I watched a lot of those buckets through my television screen. How does a team score 38 points in a college basketball game with all that talent that Miami has on the offensive? Um, I mean, there's really no explanation for it um, outside of the fact. That I, and I'll start by saying this, is that you got to get a, a bit of a, uh, a cap tip to Virginia. They are, uh, I think, you know, not just opinionated, but just uh, statistically speaking, uh, top two defensive team in the uh, in the country, you know, they're they're them in Houston are the number one and number two scoring defenses in the country. Uh, they always make it hard on opposing teams. They do a great job of uh, of control and pace and making guys kind of play their game, which and, and make it a slug fest. They usually win in the fifties or the sixties. But uh, just with like you said, with the roster that Miami has. Um, it's still, to me, just in, uh, unacceptable. They just went through so many scoring droughts, uh, and they got a ton of guys there uh, that are that are veteran guys. Uh, some of them are veteran guys and making a lot of money. Other guys are a little bit younger, but you know they got guys there that are capable. Uh, but the, right now, they're just not showing up to the party, man. Thirty-eight points in a forty-minute game is crazy. Is that praise for Virginia, or is that blame? that belongs to Miami, McCall. Yeah, you know what? I, 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 I'm thinking this past weekend with Miami and the, they turn um, they have it right now. The score and Villanova game. See it again tonight. It's it's tough to watch. I know I got put on blast on night with my face over my. But what is offense more than me? Um, I think it's praise to Virginia's defense. I do. You got to give them credit. Like Jarrell said, I mean that that that's what they do. It's their identity. It's how they play. They want to slow the game down. They want to be less possessions in the game. But you know, I think you know Miami's got to. They've got to figure some things out. You know, um, at times this year, they've looked absolutely outstanding and terrific and like an NCAA tournament team. And there's been times where they haven't. So the inconsistency, the lack of consistency for Miami is something that that Coach L, uh, I'm sure, is going to address. You're talking about another legend in the game that continues to do it and do that level. Um, But for Miami to be a tournament team and a a bona fide tournament team, the the lack of consistency has got to get figured out. We, we saw a great Laranega moment tonight where 
it, it, the timeout was taken and he, he's sitting off to the side. I don't want to even look at my guys. Uh, he's never short on a few of those moments every single year where we see a little bit of the personality. But Jarrell, I thought you made a good point. Uh, you kind of subtly weaved this into your, your first analysis of this game. They got a lot of old guys, a lot of veterans that are getting paid. That's that's new in college basketball, right? And I think, you know, I, I don't ever like to question motivations necessarily, but this is a program, fellas, that sort of bought their way to a Final Four last season, brought a lot of the key names back, lost a few of the biggest names, and tried to go the plug-and-play route, but the bright or the the lights haven't been the brightest yet this regular season, and I'm starting to worry that they're running out of time. Jarrell, do you think that that honestly plays a part in this at all? Like guys that are cashing their checks, and that's it's kind of the story here. Uh, I mean, I do. I think it plays a pivotal part in it, and and uh, and that part of me wasn't saying that uh, to kind of throw necessarily shade at those guys. It's just the it's the it's the 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 reality of the situation uh and they kind of been one of the teams i felt like they have done that that did a really good job in these last couple years of plugging and playing and really to be honest with you throwing money at guys to make sure that you either retain the really good players that you do have or to go try to get some other guys out of the transfer portal that you might be able to get to come over uh and it's you know it's nothing wrong with that it's part of the game now and i felt like that they did a really good job of it but at the same time um when you're making money like that and uh you know it's kind of public knowledge for everybody at this point um you know it comes with a a different set of responsibility and pressure to it as well so you know tonight uh you know nigel pack uh, cleveland uh, combined four points in the you know a 20 point loss so I mean, you do with it what you will, you know what I mean? But at, at the end of the day, it's not lack of talent. Those guys have the talent. They're really good players. They got to play better. Right now, they just look like a team that doesn't have an identity. And I think that was just essentially the uh, the difference in tonight's game. Virginia always has and always will have an identity under Tony Bennett. He does what he does. He's really good at it. They win a lot of games with it. Uh, and it still works, even though he doesn't always have the most talent on his roster. And Miami looks like a team that's kind of just, you know, blowing in the wind aimlessly and looking for answers. Yeah. Yeah, this is now four of the last five games Virginia has held their opponent to under 53 points in a basketball game. Now, that's that's just crazy to me. And some of this is the, is. the opponent they play. They played Louisville in that run. They played Notre Dame in that run. But uh, this defense is nothing short of elite. I was hosting the uh, Fielding the 68 Bracketology show we do on this network every Monday and Friday. This afternoon's show was great. Go watch it. It's on the YouTube channel. But uh, Virginia was one of the, the final four teams mentioned in the field when we were doing bubble talk from our experts. And I kind of just step back for a second because I'm not a bracketology guy by any means, but they're 18 and five now. Like th this team has a bunch of wins. Has it been pretty this season? No, but McCall, I have a hard time believing an 18 and five Tony Bennett team is really in danger to miss the tournament. What are you seeing there? Are, are, have we, are we not talking about them enough? I mean, they've won seven <laughs> in a row. I, I mean, early in the year, they lost to Memphis and everyone was so high on memphis early in the year um i know they've had their struggles as of late but it's just like and it's it, it kind of fits tony bennett's personality right just kind of even keeled we'll just keep picking off teams we don't need all the attention <clears throat> all the flash we don't need all the social media posts we don't need the field of 68 anointing us that we'll be in the final four in phoenix we're just going to keep winning games and that's what they're doing. It's like they're 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 fitting their coach's personality, and nobody's talking about them. And it's it's impressive. I mean, you're talking about. I think there's only seven coaches in college basketball today that have won national championships. He's one of them. So the guy knows exactly what he's doing, and his team, their culture, their identity. To Jarrell's point, they have it. They know who they are. They know how they're going to play. It hasn't changed. People may, you know, get frustrated with his style of play or don't think it's, you know, going to translate to winning games. Oh, no, it translates to winning games. And he's only one of seven coaches actively coaching college basketball. It's won a national championship. So maybe we need, we need to start talking about 
Virginia more, even though I don't know if Coach Bennett wants us to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a great number, one of seven. And, uh, yeah, quiet, tough, and still there. Words that I think would still describe Tony Bennett in the today's day and age. A lot of guys from his era said no more, right? I'm done with the sport. Tony Bennett just hanging around kind of under the radar, a team I would not want to see at this point in the season uh, on the opposite end of my schedule. But, gentlemen, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say this game was more about Miami to me than it was about Virginia. And uh, I have something to get off my chest, gentlemen. I'm ready to say it. It's my vaulted prediction of the day. Vaulted is an app that allows you to participate in daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. It is the place for you to store your own predictions forever. By using the vaulted challenge feature, you can prove that you are smarter than your friends like Matt McCall and Jarrell McNeil. Go download the vaulted app. It's spelled V-L-T-E-D to challenge your friends, store your predictions, and join daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. My vaulted challenge for the two of you tonight is this prediction. I've seen enough. Miami's missing the NCAA tournament, gentlemen. Uh, I don't buy it. I think they are running out of time. This team is 6-6 six and six in ACC play right now, 15-8 and eight overall. They haven't beaten anybody with a pulse this season. Their best win was Clemson at home. If you haven't watched Clemson lately, that's a team that just cannot get it done, even if they play well in a big game. Their schedule's heating up. They have to go at Clemson. They have North Carolina twice, and they have to play Duke. I, I like they haven't won the easy part of their ACC schedule right now. Yes, it is some opportunities, but with the lack of defense, the lack of want to on that side, and just something feels wrong. It seems like the injury bug gets this team every single game. Something is up. I don't like the vibes with this team. I do not like what I saw tonight. I think this team is officially in my NIT bracketology picture. Uh, that leads me, though, guys, back to the ACC picture because if I'm ready to cross off Miami from my contender status who else can work their way up the ladder here we've got North Carolina at the top by two games right now we've got Duke and Virginia both with three losses in conference play and then there's a pretty large drop off to like the NC states the Wake Forests of the world uh McCall outside of the top three North Carolina Virginia and Duke who do you think is the next best team in this conference I, I mean, I think it's it's a toss up. I mean, I think you got to put NC State and Wake Forest in that next category, uh, just based on their body of work. Clemson, those are probably the next three teams, uh, based on what they've done, um, and you know the losses, the wins, you know the bad losses. That that's the thing with Miami too. I mean, Miami lost to Louisville. I mean, that's a that's a bad loss. Like you. To be in that next tier outside of, you know, Carolina, Duke, you, you just got to avoid those bad losses in conference play, you know. So I'm going to go with, with Wake Forest, Clemson, and NC State. I think they're in that next tier. Um, but it's, just, it's not been a great year for the ACC, and I think everybody knows it. Uh, that doesn't mean that an ACC team, I think Carolina has been absolutely terrific. It doesn't mean that, that they can't end up in Phoenix because the league's been down, but um, I th it's not been one of the better years for the ACC, and I know I'm stating the obvious. Yeah, it's a bummer. Jarrell, same question to you. Outside of Duke, Virginia, North Carolina, who do you trust most in this league? You know, that's um, that, that is a tough one. Outside of Duke, I, I, I would probably still go – I would probably go. Um, it might. It might be Virginia. I think it might be Virginia, and that's just based Outs off of no Virginia. Out you said oh, Virginia's out make... too. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, okay. Hey, yeah, you know, I'm tough. making it tough, man. You I'm can't claim yeah. your teams, man. I'm gonna say Wake Forest. I'm gonna go Wake Forest. Um, at least Wake. You know, I like. I really like their guards. They have uh, explosive backcourt that can put up points. Uh, I think they struggle a little bit at times defensively, but uh, man, uh, that would probably be the next best team in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I like the Wake Forest shout, guys. I do. Uh, I was curious if either one of you was going to be devious enough to take NC State. Uh, like that's, that's just not a name I can say out loud and feel good about it as I'm doing it. Uh, but I don't know if there is one, guys. Miami's the one I wanted to pick before tonight as the team that could emerge. And like I said, I think that's an NIT team now. 
It's ugly times in our CNTO's conference. Fellas, Kansas is going to overtime with Kansas State. So coming up, we're going to skip ahead to some of our Monday overreactions. That's next on After Dark. As you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM this season. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 each and every week of the college basketball season. We have a special offer that will be available starting on Tuesday, January 9th, and running through Monday, February 12th, the morning after Super Bowl 58. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, in honor of the big game, you can use the bonus code FIELD158 and you'll get $158 in free bets on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not you win that first bet. Here's how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD158. Deposit at least $5 and place your first wager on any game. You'll receive $158 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure that you use that bonus code FIELD158 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly, which happens quite a bit. When you cross state borders, you just log into your existing account and fire away. You don't have to create separate accounts in each state. It's easy, it's simple, it's clean. And most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the heart of the college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops, odd boosts, and my favorite, a nice juicy parlay boost. So download the BetMGM app and sign up today. Field 158. We are back live on the Field of 68 After Dark. Thank you for joining us tonight. We got Matt McCall. We got Jarrell McNeil here. My name is Greg Waddell. And a little look behind the curtains for anyone listening or watching this show right now. It's supposed to be time to talk about Kansas and Kansas State. However, they just entered overtime. That's what's going on right now in Manhattan. So as soon as that game wraps, we will have a live reaction for you later in the show. And uh, for those of you that do have the Bet MGM app at home, if you want to jump on this live, just take a quick note for me. Jerome Tang is 10-0 and as the head coach at Kansas State in overtime games in the last year and a half. That's pure insanity. We'll see if that goes to 11-0 tonight. Uh, McCall, <laughs> what was your overtime record, man? What you uh, Do you know this off the top it of your head? It wasn't 10-0. It wasn't 10-0. I'm going to be sitting here talking to you guys. <laughs> it's pure insanity, man. I guess you'd, you'd flip a coin. That could look a whole lot different. Anyways, I do, digress. Do you, but hold on, hold on. Do you, do you think he's saying that in the huddle right now? Hey, guys, we're getting ready to knock off the number four team in the country. We're 10-0. and 0. We don't it's lose overtime ready. games. This is what we do. <laughs> we win games in overtime. This is who we are. This yeah. is what we do. Thousand percent. And then the hype man, who we're trying to figure out who that is on the end of the bench. <laughs> We don't know if he's a strength coach, but he's got a towel. But every single time they score, he turns to the crowd and starts going like this. <laughs> yeah, pump it but up. But whatever his role is, he's doing a great job. He's the hype man. Yeah, you guys have five extra minutes to do the scout work on who that hype man is. So uh, Jarrell and McCall will be on that for us by the time we get to it. All right, we're going to do some Monday overreactions here until the Kansas game ends. Uh, this is McCall's favorite game. Everybody knows this if you've listened to the show this year. <laughs> I'm going to start with what I think is the hottest overreaction that is on my list tonight. The Kentucky Wildcats will not make it out of the first weekend. We've seen enough with this team. This defense cannot be trusted. They don't know who their center is right now. They're going to lose in one of the first two rounds. Is that an overreaction? Is that a correct reaction? Jarrell, what do you think? I'm, you know, I'm, I, I won't say I'm, I'm, I'm positive. It's not an overreaction. Um, Kentucky is just a, a, a very different team because I feel like they're one of the only teams in the country who has uh, for sure the talent to win it all or get to a final four. Like maybe, maybe the most talented team as far as just youth and young guys as well too. But at the same time, they have so much inexperience uh, and they and they've had some injuries and guys in and out of the lineups, guys coming back, uh, you know, guys getting reinstated and getting cleared by the NCAA, uh, and it it just hasn't allowed them enough time to put it all together. But with their youth and inexperience, 
I think it's quite possible that they could end up playing a really tough opponent or, 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 or a wild matchup in that second or first round, man. So I don't think it's an overreaction at all. I think it's possible. I think the Wildcats could be looking at an early upset if, uh, if you know, all those guys don't show up and ain't ready to go come March Madness time. McCall? Yeah, I, I don't think it's an overreaction. I, I really don't. Uh, to Drell's point, they, they haven't been healthy. DJ Wagner's been out. They've got guys in and out of the lineup. You know, how are they going to play? Who's playing the five spot? Who's playing the power forward spot? You know, this team is extremely talented, and they could end up in Phoenix. I believe that. I, I don't think it's an overreaction, but I think they've got some things with this young team that they're going through some adversity right now that could really help them if you think about it. You know, to lose to Florida at home, to like, I mean, when's the last time, you know, Kentucky lost back to back games in Rupp Arena? I mean, it, it, like it's a difficult place to play, um, but they're going through some teams, which gives this team an opportunity to grow and come together. I think they've got to just figure different things out defensively. I think they've got to figure out what's their best offensive lineups. And when they're clicking and the ball's flying up the floor and it's being hopped around and Dillingham and Reed Shepard are, are playing at a high level, like you, you got to rock with that lineup. Are you going to play Trey Mitchell at the five? Are you going to play him at the four? Like, you know, how are you utilizing him when, when he's at the four? How are you guarding pick and rolls? I've been talking about it all year. And um, I think those are the, the question marks. But, like, look, they're a free throw away from beating the Florida Gators. And Tennessee's really, really good. I don't think we talk about Zakai Ziegler's performance enough. I mean, I know we touched on it a little bit last night, but you're talking about a guy that was one of the best guards in the SEC. He goes down last year. He's struggling to find his rhythm. And the performance that he put on in Rupp Arena the other night was impressive. I still think Kentucky can get to Phoenix. I just think Cal's juggling guys in and out of the lineup, who's healthy, who's not healthy, who's playing the five spot, who's playing the four, and, and trying to manage all that. You know, you, you, you've got to figure that out. You know, sometimes less is more because guys know their roles. They're, they know their positions. So less is more sometimes. And when you keep at and I said this about Big Z coming in. I said, look, and there was a lot of overreaction to his first game. Rightfully <laughs> so. But there was a lot of yeah. overreaction. How does that affect everybody else? That's Cal's biggest challenge. I said it on the field of 68. How does that affect everyone else? Are they looking over their shoulder? Because before I didn't have to do that because I could go out there and play my game and know that even if I made a mistake, I may come out for a second, but I'm going right back in there. So maybe for this team, less is more. Strengthening the bench, strengthening the lineup. But again, I mean, they're one free throw away from from beating the Gators. And then let's give Tennessee some credit. Let's give Zakai Ziegler some credit, man. That was an impressive performance by that team. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, the the number you mentioned, uh, how many times has have they lost back-to-back games in Rupp? That's only the third time under Cal in his Kentucky tenure that they have lost two times in a row in Rupp. Uh, both the previous times, for the record, were the 2021 season where they had a 9-16 and record. So outside of the, the crazy COVID year where they were horrible, uh, it's never happened. This is the first time. They have some things to fix, but – I don't think you guys are wrong for thinking that that uh, is potentially not an overreaction. Let's move to the next one on my list here. Uh, my country here in the Big Ten, Purdue, went into the Kohl Center, got the victory over the Badgers. They are now alone at the top of the Big Ten standings, a place that they have become very comfortable with. My overreaction is this. The Big Ten title race is over. It's done. <laughs> Illinois and Wisconsin, a game back in the loss column. Purdue doesn't need any more room than that. McCall, what do you think? I think it's over. I think it's over. Purdue's the best team. I, I said it last night to you, Greg. Can we just get to Phoenix and just throw UConn and Purdue out there and let them battle it out? Because I think they're in, the, in, a, in a class of their own. I really do. Um, I think Carolina's good. We saw some flaws this past weekend from Houston. We're watching Kansas trying to re respond after the game on Saturday, which is a difficult thing to do. And I know we're going to to get into that. But Kansas, that was such an emotional game. They played so great in that game, trying to respond after that and, and knock off Kansas State. And they're down four with a minute and 50 seconds to go in overtime. 
But I think those two are in a class of their own in terms of UConn and Purdue. And I think Purdue is in a complete class of their own in the Big Ten. Jarrell, what do you think? I think it's an overreaction. Um, and it's not because, you know, Purdue isn't worthy. And I do think they are that good. And uh, obviously, it's going to be some some uphill sledding for some of these other teams. But I do think that uh, I do think that Illinois is going to be able to push them a little bit. Um, I think the win they got the other night was huge, uh, just to stay close to a game back of those guys. Uh, obviously, Wisconsin is in the mix too, but uh, I do think uh, Illinois is is kind of built to withstand this last little stretch run just to try to keep enough pressure on them. And obviously the daunting task is that at some point they're going to have to beat them head to head. Uh, so I'm sure they'll have that game circling on their, on, on their calendar. But if they can stay within the game uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, I think they'll have a shot to at least push them and, put, and apply a little bit of pressure for the, for the Big Ten title. So I, I very rarely like to dodge my own questions on this show, but uh, I'm going to ask if I can refrain from answering if this is an overreaction until Saturday night when I know if Illinois was able to go into the Breslin Center and beat Michigan State or not. That's the only one on Illinois' schedule that's left up until they play Wisconsin and Purdue in the first week of March that I think Illinois is going to lose. They got a bunch of games where they're favored by double digits in between this uh, Michigan State game Saturday and the beginning of March. If they can steal a win on the road as two-point underdogs against Tom Izzo, I don't think this race is over because they get to host Purdue. As Coleman Hawkins has been very <coughs> online and loud about, uh, he has that game circled. He has work to do to get there. But we'll see. Uh, so ask me on Saturday night, gentlemen. We'll, maybe we'll phone into After Dark and I can tell you whether or not the Big Ten race is officially over. To the Big East, where I have a very similar question, and we'll throw it to Jarrell first. Marquette, in the Big East standings, your team. Two games back from the leader, that's UConn. Uh, McCall and I, we're all over UConn. We think they're in a tier alone at the top of college basketball with Purdue. Right now, they're certainly alone at the top of the Big East. Is it an overreaction to say that Marquette could unseat them, come from behind, and potentially earn a share or more of the Big East regular season championship? No, it's not. It's not an overreaction at all, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and it's and it's, par it's partially just because of the way that uh, you know the schedules kind of play out here. And at the end of the day, uh, Marquette still has UConn twice, home and away. Uh, so they'll have to come to Milwaukee. We'll have to go to UConn. Uh, and I think that that first one that, that's coming up is on the 17th of, uh, February. So those are going to be big games. Uh, when, uh, a couple weeks back when, uh, Marquette was having a little bit of trouble, guys started going down with injuries. Uh, Kolick was struggling. Jones was struggling. Uh, you know, it seemed like the the sky was kind of falling. Uh, and I tried to tell everybody just to stay calm that, you know, that they were going to weather the storm and kind of right the ship here. And they've done just that. Uh, some guys came back. Stevie Mitchell's been huge. David Joplin has been uh, fantastic over the last couple of games, especially with guys out uh, losing Sean Jones for the year was huge. Uh, but Chase uh, Chase Roach just came back as well, too, man. So those guys have kind of figured it out. And uh, and I would be remiss to not mention the emergence of uh, of Ben Gold, man. Ben Gold has been playing some good ball. He gives us an added element of some size and another guy that can sh actually stretch the floor, floor with his shooting. So when uh, when they get they throw out those lineups with him and also out there, it gives us a different look, a different feel, and gives uh, you know just kind of switches it up and gives us another offensive threat, man. But they can definitely win the Big East. Uh, they'll have to beat UConn at least one out of two times to do it. Because I, I feel like Marquette's, the rest of their remaining games are a lot easier. I mean, a lot harder than uh, UConn. I think UConn has two two road games that are, I think they go to at DePaul and at Georgetown. So uh, it ended up being a little bit more favorable for UConn. But uh, if Marquette can take them down one, one of the two times, they'll have a shot to win the Big East. Paul? Huh? I'm just more focused on the officiating at the end of this Kansas State <laughs> right now. What, like, what is going on? What like what is what is going on? Did you see the foul call on Hunter Dickinson? Like what like what, I did. what is going on? Um sorry. Um no, I, I think look, going into the season, everyone had 
Marquette pick to win the league. And they've gone through some adversity. And I think that's important. And, Greg, we talked about this last night with UConn. Look, it's Purdue, it's UConn. They're the two best teams in the country. And with what UConn lost last year, with what they have coming back, they really haven't faced a ton of adversity. Marquette has. Um, So do I think that Marquette can catch them and win the Big East? No, not right now, not with how things are. Would I be shocked if they did? No. Tyler Kolick, he's still one of the best players in the country, you know, and, and, and that team has gone through some stuff this year, which I think helps teams, especially when you start getting towards the end of February and March because it brings your team together. It does one of two things, and Drell knows this. It either brings your team together or it drives you further apart. Rips and apart, yeah. with Shaka and the experience that he has and all the wins that he has and everything that he's gone through as a head coach, there's no question it's going to bring that team together. And um, another team that you'd never be shocked if they end up in Phoenix, the parody of college basketball this year. And I don't think it's an overreaction uh, to think yeah. that they could you know, push UConn. It could happen. All right, we will react live to Kansas and Kansas State's finish coming up next on After Dark. Big news, guys. I am thrilled to announce that we have partnered with Autograph, a company founded by the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. The Autograph fandom app gives you access to the best college hoops content, fan contests, and exclusive rewards like discounted tickets, all for doing the things that diehard fans like you already do following your favorite team in the news and listening to podcasts just like this one. When Tom, and yes, I am calling him Tom, we're on a first name basis these days, co-founded Autograph, he had one mission in mind, change the fan experience for the better. It works like this. You get all of your college hoops content you want in one place. You get articles from your favorite writers, pods from your favorite hosts, Contests from your favorite creators all on the feeds and the sites that you already enjoy. But instead of having to go to all these different places, it all comes to you in one spot. The autograph fandom map. But here's the best part. The more content that you consume, the higher you rank in the app. As you consider the level up and status on the app, you can unlock unique rewards curated exclusively for you. So download the free autograph app in the app store and use the referral code F68, that's F68, or tap in at the link in the description below or in the podcast app of your choosing to start earning points for doing something as normal as listening to this very podcast. It really is that simple. Welcome back here. It's the Field of 68 After Dark. We are live reacting to Monday night's action in college basketball. And what that means right this very moment is that Kansas is down two to Kansas State with 18 seconds left in overtime. Arthur Kaluma headed to the free throw line. We'll see if the Wildcats can ice this one out. Uh, I'm going to throw it to Matt McCall here first. I got Jarrell McNeil and McCall with me. My name is Greg Waddell. McCall, we've been talking about it before we clicked record on the show tonight. We've been talking about it throughout the show, sprinkling this into our overreactions. This has been a ref show. What do you think? And coming off the weekend for the Big 12 officials and what happened with Scott Drew at Baylor, I, I mean, they needed a great performance tonight. They needed an outstanding performance. I, I, I just thought there were some questionable calls coming down the stretch of this game. I, I didn't like the foul call on Hunter Dickinson. I didn't like that at all. Um, that was not a foul in this last possession either. It, you, you know, you're so quick to call it because you think that there's – look, referees are human beings. I totally get it. They make mistakes like all of us, right? As a coach, you make mistakes with substitutions. You make mistakes with – Play you make mistakes with defensive coverage, different things. As a player, you miss shots. You're never perfect. But officials make mistakes too. The only difference is accountability. There's accountability because <laughs> you can lose accountability for you can lose your officials. There's not a lot of accountability because they're still going to be refing that next game, and it's just. I mean, what happened to Scott Drew on on Saturday was like, like, I don't think the guy curses 
I don't think he ever. I don't think I've ever heard Coach Drew say a curse word, and he got thrown out for being out of the box. We've seen coaches this year closing out on players on the sideline, right? I mean, Shaka Smart, you love him. I mean, the guy's out in a defensive <laughs> stance in the middle of the floor. Then I don't think he's been te- teed up yet. You know, so. I, I don't know. I, I just – some of these calls coming down the stretch of this game. I mean, credit Kansas State. They're going to get the win. Um, and this is a huge win for Jerome Tang. You know, coming out of the whole Iowa State deal, you know, the sign killing gate, whatever was on, who was sitting on, the, you know, taking videos, things like that. And, you know, T.J. Altsberger not very happy about that, and, and rightfully so. If it wasn't going on, then he shouldn't have been happy. Um, so this is a great win, but I just – some of the calls coming down the stretch here, a little bit head-scratching for me. Yeah, Kansas State just to reset. Five-point lead now with five seconds left. Uh, it does look like they are going to get this victory, barring some miracle happening. We will confirm the final score as soon as we have it. Uh, Jarrell, is this a season-saving win potentially for Kansas State? They had lost four straight coming into this. Obviously, you want to get the rivalry game, but they're going to find themselves 15-8 and eight now with everything still in front of them with uh, a couple of really impressive Big 12 wins now under their belt with the Baylor win in overtime and now the Kansas win in overtime. Yeah, this is this is, this is going to go down as, uh, as a huge win for K-State and uh... – they kind of at that swing point of the season. And, you know, this happens throughout the course of a season. And Matt would know this, too. Just you get to those lows and it's like, man, if you can get this game at home in a good environment versus, you know, a quad one type team, uh, you know, it can kind of just shift and change your momentum and get things going back the other way. And, uh, you know, I think this is obviously they were probably a, a team that was somewhere around the bubble prior to this <clears throat> anyway so uh a big win like this to kind of give them a boost and it almost be like two wins for them uh going forward and then they'll have opportunity down the stretch here to get some more quality wins but this is a, this is definitely a feel good win man and uh a- after four tough losses in the big 12 the big 12 can be a grind at times especially going into all of these great hostile environments man and they got a ton of really good ones in big 12 country uh, to get a win here at home against Kansas has to feel good, especially when they uh, traditionally haven't done great against Kansas, just in the rivalry in general. So uh, they don't they don't have a ton of wins against them, uh, even at their building. So uh, this would be a big one for K-State. I said the number earlier in the show, guys. 11-0 and in overtime games in a season and a half. That's Jerome Tang's number. Now, I, I, I would love for the stats and research department here at the lovely field of 68 to look this up for us. But I, I have a hard time believing there's many programs in this sport. That there's, no play. there's no way. There's no way. Like, as a there's second no year head coach, too. Are you that's kidding insane. me? 11 yeah. and 0? So, so it, genuinely, McCall, is this a stroke of luck? unlike any we've seen in college basketball, or is there something about Jerome Tang's ability to get the best out of his team in clutch situations? I mean, look, you know, there's probably a little bit of both, right? I mean, there's a little bit of luck involved because a shot could have gone in and here or a missed free throw there, but he finds a way to keep his team calm in these types of situations, which is extremely impressive. You know, uh, again, Greg, like coming out of that whole Iowa State deal, you know, and, and I talked about it this morning on, on Big 12 radio on Sirius XM. It's like, what, like, did that whole situation just evaporate? Like, is that is it is it all over with? Is And has that been a distraction for his team? And have they had to deal with it and his players and everyone? And then they go on a losing streak and, you know, lost two games by, you know, you know, a lot of teams would lose at Houston by 20, but then to turn around and lose at home by 20 um, and then lose to Oklahoma State, I, you know, uh, oh, is this an issue? Are they, are they still dealing with this? So this was this was kind of one of those litmus tests is like, hey, they needed this. Like they, they needed to get this win to get them back on track. And huge win. I mean, Ty Perry is outstanding. He's a really good player. You look at what he did at North Texas and all the wins and all the accolades that he had there. 
Um, so this was this was big for Jerome Tang and his team. I'm sure he'll be dancing over there with the student section at any point in time now. And I think I saw the hype right. man trying to tell the students not to come on the floor. I don't know if that was the hype man, or not, but there was something about don't come on the floor. So a, a good know. hype man knows when it's time to be hype and when it's time not to be hype. McCall, okay, he knows where to draw the line. Uh, he's the man. <laughs> Reel it in. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. I, uh, I challenged our, our stats and research department to, to look some things up for me. Look at how great they responded here at the Field of 68. I have three numbers in a row for you right now that are ridiculous. Uh, Kansas State's six overtime wins this season is a record in Division One basketball. We're, we have a month and a half left of the season, and that's already a record. Let's compare this number for Jerome Tang in overtime, 11-0 and in the last season and a half. Uh, in their careers, guys, Coach K in overtime was 33-27. and Calipari, 30-18. and Roy Williams, 22-20. and John Wooden in overtime in his career was 6-6. Six and six. Jerome Tang in a season and a half is 11 and 0. Like, this is completely unprecedented. And if you want to drill it down even further, Jerome Tang is one of the hottest, quote unquote, hires in college basketball in the last decade, I would say. All the hype that last year's team had, uh, certainly all of the, the speculation of is Jerome Tang named as a potential hire in the future? 27% of his wins in his Kansas State tenure have come in overtime games. That's insane. <laughs> and here he is getting a huge rivalry win over the Kansas Jayhawks. Uh, I want to ask you guys about the Kansas side of things quickly because after the win over Houston, everybody was feeling great. Rock Chalk, Johnny Furphy, his emergence, all of that. It was a pretty quiet night from Furphy tonight. And I thought we saw some of Kansas's limitations rear their ugly head, namely Hunter Dickinson struggling to defend some ball screen coverages. That's been an issue with him in his career. It looked like Bill Self was trying a variety of different looks there tonight, and none of them were really working. McCall, what did you see uh, schematically from Kansas tonight that was hurting him? Yeah, I think, too, and, and Jeff Goodman said this to us this morning on SiriusXM, our, our great colleague, Jeff Goodman, um, that he tried to interview Bill Self after the game the other night um, in the fog, and Bill Self said, hey, I don't have any time because i got to get on to Kansas State because he knew – how talented Kansas State was. I mean, he, he knows how good they are. And to have a win like that on Saturday when everyone was talking about Houston being the team in the Big 12, they're the team to beat, they're the best team in the Big 12, and then you do what you did and score 43 points in the first half and basically run them out of your building, to turn around and have to play on Monday – on the road against a team that's lost four straight, that's reeling, that's desperate, that's a hard thing to do. That's a really hard thing to do. I am not surprised at all that Kansas lost this game. I think just because of the circumstances and everything that, that, that came with this coming off, what they did on Saturday and what Kansas State has been dealing with. Furphy wasn't great. He's a freshman. He's going to have his ups and downs. He's going to have his struggles. There's no question about it. Um, you know, I also thought, and, and me and Jarrell were talking about this off the air, like they missed some shots. They missed some shots that they normally made. They missed some shots that they made, you know, in the game on Saturday, which is why they blew the game open in the first half on Saturday. Some of those shots that were open looks tonight, they didn't go in. And that's basketball, you know. And there's just – like. To get yourself refocused yesterday after what you did on Saturday to try and lock in and win this one. And the NCAA tournament's different. Like, there's a different feeling. And I get it. You have an off day and you play the next day. But it's a different feeling from when you play that game at home with your fans and your crowd, and then you got to go on the road and play that game one day later. That's a challenge. And credit Kansas State. And Kansas just didn't – they couldn't recuperate after the game. They just missed some shots that they normally make. Jarrell, your thoughts? Same same exact sentiments. And it, it, I felt like Kansas kind of missed their opportunity just at the start of the second half there. 
Uh, they came out with a really good run to start out the half. They got up to about nine points. Uh, Tane called the timeout to kind of settle everything down. Uh, and, and they did a great job from that point forward of clawing back in it. And, uh, you know, Kansas score, uh, struggled to, to score for another one of those stretches of lows that we talked about. They missed some open shots, like Kevin said. Just, man, it's uh, – it, it, it was a tough loss for them, and obviously just tough scheduling in general. To have Houston, K-State, at K-State, and then Baylor coming up on Saturday is always going to be a tough stretch. It's a little bit of a trap game. They got caught up in it, and they weren't able to pull themselves out of it. And before they knew it, uh, they were in the dogfighting. And get credit to Kansas State because they were laying for them and ready to go. Desperate, like uh, just like Kevin says, <laughs> desperate teams. Yeah. Like a dangerous team. Absolutely. All right, guys, coming up, we're going to go to part two of our Monday night overreactions. That's next on After Dark. What's going on, guys? Before we get back to the show, I need to let you all know about the Field of 68 Daily, an all-encompassing college basketball newsletter that arrives in your inbox, you guessed it, daily. For less than a dollar a week, you'll wake up every morning to more than 1,500 words detailing everything that you need to know to stay up to date on the world of college basketball. From the notable mid-major upsets to the stars that are out injured, to the breakout performances that only our team of college basketball junkies watched. The Daily is edited and produced by Mike Miller, who spent more than two decades running NBC's digital written content, and is subscribed by more than half of the Division I coaching staffs, the biggest names in college basketball media, and the agents that work as power brokers in the sport. For just $50 for the year, you get access to the same information that the insiders get. And before we get you back to your regularly scheduled Field of 68 content, let me tell you guys about the Field of 68 merch store. Head over to fieldof68.shop for officially branded Field of 68 apparel. Whether you're supporting your favorite team in the student section or from the couch, there is no better way to gear up than the latest from the Field of 68. The best thing I can say about our merch is the quality of the product. Anyone that has ever worn a t-shirt knows how frustrating it is when the neck gets all stretched out and the bottom of the shirt starts looking like the bottom of bell-bottom jeans. And there's nothing worse than a hoodie that loses its snugness that makes it such a perfect way to stay warm during the cold winter weather. Whether you're shopping for yourself or for the college basketball fan in your life, everything you need is at the Field of 68.shop. We are live here on the Field of 68 After Dark. Welcome into the show. Jarrell McNeil, Matt McCall. I'm Greg Waddell. We just broke down Kansas and Kansas State's thrilling conclusion in overtime. And it's time to reconvene our Monday overreactions. I've got four more on my list here, gentlemen, before we wrap tonight's show. I'm going to start with a very simple one. I think it speaks for itself. Am I overreacting when I say... Jerome Tang is a wizard. Jarrell McNeil, yes or no? <laughs> that, that is no overreaction. Um, 11 and 0 in overtime in your first two years as a head coach is absolutely insane. Uh, so I, I, I would be I'd be terrified if I was another head coach. To, if, if, you, if you can't end that game in regulation, uh, the, your eyes go down dramatically. So. He's absolutely, absolutely not an overreaction. That's a, that's a hell of a stat there. There's some dark magic at play here, McCall. I don't care what you do in <laughs> practice. You get to overtime against your own Tang. You're dying. That's all this you're is. Dead. Yep. <laughs> it's like he's like he's like Shaq and Shazam. Okay, like I mean, there's, <laughs> he, he is. You don't want to go to overtime time with this guy. It is. It's super impressive. To Jarrell's point, look. Second year head coach to be an eleven and zero in overtime games in the best league in the country is super impressive. And credit him rallying his team, you know, going through the adversity they had the last four games. Got Kansas coming into your building. The game goes into overtime, and that was I'm telling you, man, Shaq Shazam. That was that was yeah, impressive. Simple as that. Simple as that. All right, I'm wizard. glad we could all agree. Yeah, we can all agree. I'm glad Jerome Tang, he's the wizard. Uh, these next three are going to be a little more controversial, I think. Uh, McCall, you always keep reiterating, and I agree with you. It's UConn and Purdue. They're at the top of this sport right now. Is it an overreaction to say that North Carolina belongs in that same tier and is in that tier right now at this moment with UConn and Purdue, yes or no? 
I don't think they're in the same tier. I think they're in the tier right below them. Like literally like right below them. Um, their performance on Saturday was impressive as any performance in the country. Um, Arma Armando Baycott and what he did on Saturday, the numbers that he put up. Um, I, I, I still think UConn and Purdue are in a category of their own, but we need to probably start talking about Carolina being right there. Um, Hubert Davis, you've got to put him in the category for National Coach of the Year coming out of what happened last year, all the negative talk, all the noise, all the nonsense, um, to have his team playing at the level that they're playing at. That's a tribute to him. And it's really, really impressive because he was able to block all that out and get his team to perform at this level. And even when they lost some games early in the year, it's, you know, some of the negative media, some of the people are, here we go again. And no, here we don't go again. They're the best team in the ACC. And they're in that next tier out of those top two teams in the country. Jarrell, your thoughts? I don't think it's an overreaction. Um, and I was kind of just sorting, sorting my thoughts uh, earlier going through this and uh, thinking about it that uh, the best way to kind of describe it in, in my own opinion is um, I think Purdue is the best team in the country. I think because of Zach Eady and the pieces that they have around them fit perfect. I think uh, UConn is – uh, they have the best resume in the country. I think they've been the most impressive team in the country so far up to this point as far as wins, uh, total overall record, quality wins, not dropping games that they're not supposed to lose, that sort of thing. Uh, and they face some adversity early on with guys in and out of the lineup, and they sh they show that they have the ability to win in different ways uh, with a really talented roster. And then I think uh, just currently right now, I think North Carolina is playing the best. I think they're I think they're the hottest team right now. I think they're playing the best basketball in the country. And I think they're right there talent wise with those other two teams. And listen, uh, Matt kind of hinted to it earlier when uh, when Armando Baycott is playing the way that he played against Duke. Uh, Man, watch out because there there isn't there isn't a glaring hole in that lineup, and they got all the pieces too, so they could just as easily be in this in this tier with these two powerhouse teams as well. Yeah, I think they are. And in Greg, the same too. Let me tier. Let, let me add uh, this. Let me let, let me yeah, add this, yeah. Greg. Like with North Carolina, with Hubert Davis, with Armando Baycott, like those guys have been there. Like they got yeah. to the national championship game, and yeah. then they went through everything they went through last year. And all the negativity and all that, I mean, they're hungry. I mean, they're hungry. So th th this is a, like, you want to talk about a hardened team that's been through that adversity? Like, don't be shocked if those guys are cutting the nuts down in Phoenix. McCall, on the fly right now, I'm realizing there's a sick, twisted way to make the argument that North Carolina sort of has the best parts of both Purdue and UConn's March narratives, right? Like, they've been all the way to the mountaintop like UConn has been. They've suffered the tragedy that Purdue has been. They're on the redemption arc. They have experience and they have we need to go prove everyone wrong. I don't know, man. I might have just talked myself into the heels Entering that tier with <laughs> Purdue and UConn. We'll see. We'll see. All Enter right, your pick and vaulted right now. Enter your pick and vaulted right now. Into vaulted right now. Lock it to in. This next, one, th this next one, I'm going to the West Coast Conference. Gonzaga is having their worst season under Mark Few that they've had in a very long time. Now, that's a, a huge statement of praise on behalf of Mark Few, who has been one of the best coaches in this sport his entire tenure in Spokane. However, this team may miss the NCAA tournament this season. It's as simple as that. They do not have a quad one win to this point in the year, and they do not have too many opportunities left. At Kentucky would certainly be a good one. They've got at St. Mary's to close the season. Uh, but the overreaction is this. Gonzaga's reign as the mid-major power is over. Jarrell, what do you think? Uh, I think it's an overreaction. And uh, and I'll and I'll just say it because um, I got full confidence and trust in uh, in Mark Few. To be honest, uh, I think he'll he'll figure it out. He'll get it going. Uh, the dynamic 
of the kind of the way uh, that they went about building their teams and recruiting, I think has changed with some of this stuff with the transfer portal and the NIL stuff. Uh, this year, they're obviously starting to adapt to those changes and go and get guys through the portal and getting older guys. Uh, I'm not sure what the NIL situation is, but they'll figure out a way to kind of get that good balance again of getting guys through the portal. Uh, who want to come there and, tr- and want to win big and play uh, under a really good coach and getting, uh, you know, getting those young guys in still uh, some four and five star guys. I think they'll have the ability to do that still and get a couple more of those guys out there and develop them as well and keep them for a year or two so that they can combine them all together and put together and make some of those, uh, you know, those traditional really good Gonzaga type teams. But I got full confidence in Mark Few. I don't think the rain is over just yet. Uh, now, if we see this start to be a trend going forward, like in the next year, then we'll have something to talk about. But as of right now, uh, it's one year they are in jeopardy of missing uh, the tournament. But I don't think one year necessarily just means it's it's all coming to all coming to crashing down just yet. McCall, your thoughts? Yeah, it's uh, it's a complete overreaction. I, I mean, their reign of power is not over. You know, Greg, I, I think something that doesn't get talked about enough is Tommy Lloyd was an assistant there. And people think Gonzaga is a mid-major program. And he's now the head coach at Arizona, which traditionally is one of the best programs in the country. Like, think about that. An assistant coach at Gonzaga is now the head coach at Arizona. That just goes to show you the culture that Mark Few built. And that also goes to show you what Tommy Lloyd was bringing to that team, um, which is just, I mean, like, I don't think people talk about that enough. He went from an assistant coach at Gonzaga to the head coach at Arizona. That is so impressive. And that just goes to show you what Mark Few built there. And to see fans throwing trash on the court the other night, that was, that was one of the more disappointing things I've ever seen because they're just having a little bit of a down year. Mark Few is one of the best coaches to coach this game. I got full confidence in him. The reign of power is not over. Uh, He knows exactly what he's doing. And that was, to call it like it is, that was disappointing to see those fans do that the other night. Because Gonzaga basketball has been one of the faces of college basketball over the last two decades. Yeah, 100%. I appreciate those words. Uh, The Gonzaga... Rain not over. The Drew Timmy era is over. That's for sure, though. All right, we're going to do toast quickly, boys. Uh, we got about 10 seconds each for your toast, so I'm putting you on the spot. I'll go first. You can think while I go. I'm cheersing to Tony Bennett. This man is still doing the Tony Bennett things, and he's doing them well. 37 points tonight, I believe. Insane what he held Miami to. Cheers. Matt McCall, who is your toast of the night? Give me Ty Perry. Transfer from North Texas, Kansas State. 26 points tonight. Four for ten from three, five rebounds, four assists. Ty Perry was the difference maker in this game. Jarrell Toast? I'm going Reese Beekman. Uh, it was kind of hard to choose from that first game, but they only had two guys in double figures, and he played pretty well. So I'll make it easy. He got it done. All right, from Matt McCall <laughs> for Jarrell McNeil, my name is Greg Waddell. Join us in the last call over on Stadium Fest.